All right. Thanks so much to everyone who's already joined us. I know we have a few people who are going to trickle in. So while they do, we have a few announcements. Uh, first, we're recording this session, and it's going to be available in Whova, the conference app, within a couple of weeks of the Congress ending. Um, if you'd like to ask our speakers any questions during the session, please use the Q&A area to the right of the screen um, on Whova. It will allow us to keep the questions um, so that other people can see them moving forward. Uh, that's also where you'll find the chat window, um, so you can engage with other attendees as well. Um, and we kindly ask that you keep mics and cameras off during the presentations and follow the presenter's lead on when to engage with them on. Um, I think we are ready to go get go ahead and get started. So I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, Matt, to start us. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining on and, and to the speakers to this tree mortality, post-fire tree mortality session. Um, just want to mention again that please join us for the fire circle on Friday, if you can. And with that, uh, Alina. Um, it's, uh, please go. I'm just going to share my screen here. Hey folks, I'm going to kick off this part of the session. Um, and it looks like we're moving from, you know, physiology really into empirical modeling. And I'm going to give you an introduction to the database a group of us put together. Um, it's been out for a couple of years, so you might be familiar with it already but my goal here is really to both give the background on development and what's in it to set up a couple other talks and give the whole audience um, information on considerations for use of this data and talk about the data representative representativeness of the database as a springboard for new data collection and further and future contributions And I've got to make sure my screen advances. <laughs> so one sec. OK, there we go. Um, first, I want to acknowledge my collaborators on this project. This started out of my postdoctoral work with Sharon Hood um, at the Missoula Fire Science Lab, Forest Service Fire Science Lab. Also involved in that project were Morgan Barner and Phil Van Mankum. And this collaboration has continued. Um, with Timothy Sherman and Micah Wright, who you guys are going to be hearing from, uh, building on the database we've developed and doing future work with it. So, and also I want to acknowledge that this was all funded by the Joint Fire Science Program, uh, and this is a completed project, so the final reports online under their research. The data I am talking about was developed based on contributions from over 41 studies and a whole lot of different people contributed the data and i just want to also acknowledge all those data contributors who directly corresponded with us and contributed data right here and realize that this is built on work of thousands of people who collected data in the field so i'm going to talk about the development of the fire and tree mortality database and some considerations for use because this database has a lot of empty data fields which can um, cause some trickiness in using them and there's also some variables um, particularly some injury variables that are some are derived versus observed and then speak about the representativeness of the data in terms of taxa bioclimatic niche space tree size and injury um, and then really give some talk about what that representativeness um, leads to in terms of what we would like to see in terms of new data collection and needs and really where this is going in the future. So um, obviously we're interested in understanding and predicting fire induced tree mortality for applications across a number of scales and this is an empirical database, and this empirical data can be used to parameterize models at the individual tree, stand, landscape scale, and similar modeling goes into global scale modeling um, of fire effects, although those models are usually very simplified. When doing predictive modeling using decision support systems, information on the fire behavior is often used the, to then predict an internal step, which is the fire injury from the fire, or field data 
of direct observations of fire injury is used. Based on those fire injury observations, such as the percent crown volume scorched, so the amount of the tree canopy that's scorched, or the height or presence or absence of char along the bark of the trees, those can then be used to predict whether or not a tree lives or dies. These same um, empirically derived mortality models are used in a variety of decision support systems. And our goal with putting together this database in part was to support future development of and refinement of decision support systems, but it was also to improve our theoretical and basic understanding of tree mortality processes and factors um, operating at a variety of scales. So we have a fire and tree mortality database and when we built this database, we required individual tree measurements of the species. Uh, mostly, we allowed some trees in that didn't, that were just identified as trees, but almost all the observations of species. The diameter at breast height and some measurement of fire injury. Now, those fire injury, me injury measurements varied a lot from data set to data set. And crown length scorch and crown volume scorch were the most common. We also included information on other stressors such as bark presence, uh, bark beetle presence, not bark presence. And we needed post-fire status, but it varied which years that was measured in. Most common was a measurement in year three and then year one. And then the first five years after fire generally were more likely to have measurements than later or observations of tree status than later. Some data sets only had one observation of tree status, some had many. We'll come back to that issue. So we basically built this data by asking, hey, hi, will you share your data with us? Um, we solicited data contributions. We pulled in data from paper, paper records, publicly available archives, uh, manager um, date, you know, manager archives that were sort of kept privately by land managers researcher archives that were cited in peer-reviewed research and data we already had on hand. Oh, and I guess another big source is federal agency databases, especially the National Park Service um, and their fire effects monitoring program. So in the end, right now we have a, a database with 164,000 tree observations, well, trees with about 170 tree observations because some trees have been burnt by multiple fires, 142 species, 62 genera, over 400 fires. Uh, most of the observations are in the western U.S. and you'll know that there's a big glaring gap. Now, it's a lot of trees, but when we start drilling down, we're going to see that there's definitely limitations on what type of analyses you can do once you start looking at species specific analyses. Before we get into that, I just want to make a note about how this is currently structured. You know, we've got individual tree measurements that are linked by two fields, the, the year fire name composite and the data set, because we had some, uh, some fires that were sampled more than once to the actual fire location and year. We've got species bark thickness data, and then data providence data. And they, so these are all separate CVS files that can be linked together based on common fields. We had some challenges in terms of reformatting and coding and dealing with longitudinal data sets. And then another challenge was just dealing with these empty data fields when putting the database together. But we did significant quality control and continued use has allowed us to continue improving the quality control um, and correct really minor errors that remained in this database. So if you want to look at the data, the research data archive is on the USDA Forest Service site. It's been downloaded. Um, I think that's incorrect. I think it's supposed to be 200. And 18 times. Sorry about that typo. And there's a scientific data paper describing the database. So in order to actually use this for empirical modeling, because not all observe, not all fields are observed at all times, you need to subset the data down to account for those missing variables and to have a compact, complete data set for analysis. So I want to go through some 
common um, sort of challenges that could come from anyone else wanting to do this because we do want everyone else to be able to use this data and put it into practice for their own um, research. So one first thing to talk about is every contributed study had a slightly different minimum tree size cutoff. And so what I'm showing you here is like, um, this is the DBH of the tree species on the x-axis. And this is just like a, a crown volume scorch on the y. And you can see that in between the size and the injury variables, there's just some space where there's no observations for some species. And these minimum tree size cutoffs really differed between different species. So when people are using these data, you may want to apply a minimum threshold and remove, especially if you're comparing species, um, and remove species or observations that are too small, for example, um, or like where the, the small trees are not represented in one species and are represented in another. We also want to think about representativeness across taxa, um, bioclimatic niche space, size, and injury. So what do I mean by taxa and bioclimatic niche space? Um, Oops, I feel like there's one slide out of order there. I'm going to cover this first and just in terms of what we covered. So when we did model evaluations that are already published, we set some very um, really liberal thresholds for evaluating these models. You know, we'd evaluate even if there's only 10 live and dead trees. And even with these very liberal thresholds, even though there's over 60 species represented in the database, we're only able to evaluate 44 of these species. And really only 25 had good, strong sample sizes. So despite aggregating all this data and combining it, the sample size for species space is really limited to 25 fairly common species. And these are not the most common species in the United States, there are more the most common conifers in the Western United States uh, dominates the database. So the taxa within the existing database is dominated by Western North American conifers. Um, Quercus alba, which was supposed to be labeled up high but is showing up in a different space, is an example of an Eastern gymnosperm where we had really limited representativeness within both um geographic space and bioclimatic space so when the eastern gymnosperms are present in the database the sample size is really small and one approach would be to combine data for different um say different eastern oaks but they have really different traits so that might not be the best approach to get good information the other approach would be to do targeted sampling for the species that already exist to increase the bioclimatic space shown on the right here and the geographic space shown on the left in the map. So just to give you an idea of what we have um, with like sufficient sample sizes to even like look at the data and do any analysis, you know, in terms of gymnosperms, there's or angiosperms, there's just a, a handful listed that had enough to analyze and assess but in terms of gymnosperms there's a lot of western gymnosperms but very few eastern and then sort of as a preface to the talks that are coming later in this session once you start applying stricter data standards to this database the sample of species that can be assessed really decreases so if you require that in, an injury variable such as crown volume scorch be assessed in the field, um, your data set decreases. And another approach would be to use modeling that accounted for some of the crown volume scorch be, being assessed in the field and some of it being calculated. But that really decreases your data set. And then if you require good um, samples across both tree sizes and injury levels, that also, and across multiple fires, that really also decreases your sample size. So what I want to do here is highlight a few species that we do have large samples of and 
these species still once again dominated by western conifers had sufficient samples across crown volume scorch injury levels diameter sizes um, with at least 10 samples per fire represented and at least 50 samples of trees now for certain types of modeling you really want to have a sufficient number of samples within each fire and across fires right and so if we do that we really decrease our sample down to four main species um, douglas fir ponderosa pine white fir abies concolor and pinus contorta lodgepole pine and you'll see an example of us using those four species for analysis later in this session so where is more data needed clearly it's needed in angiosperms there are some challenges to this based on the availability of field sampling methods in angiosperms because they drop their um, leaves, they're deciduous, most of them. They evaluating crown scorch is maybe not the best way to assess fire effects. So this, we may need to enter additional fields or find different variables to assess the injury to angiosperms in the fields. And right now, the way the database is currently set up, we don't track resprouting, although that could be something that we could do in the future if the data became available. I would suggest that for species where there are like relatively large sample sizes, that targeted data collection across more fires and geographic gaps would be um, a centered, uh, additive way to really improve the data. And here's the species where that could happen. We've got Quercus cologiae, which is an oak in California. And we have quite a few samples, but there's portions of its range that aren't sampled and portions of its bioclimatic bio space where there's here high climatic moisture deficit, which might be of interest, um, where we haven't captured any samples. This is also too, true in terms of genre. We've got quite a lot of samples of different juniper species aggregated together there might be enough to do an additional analysis focusing on juniper, but when they're separated, they're not. And then, you know, in addition to targeting the undersampled geographic and bioclimatic space, we also want to sample the tree sizes that are not represented in the database, such as where there are few small trees, but we actually have pretty good samples outside of those small trees. So where are we going with this in the future? Um, one thing I want to talk about is we're planning on putting out a new version, an updated version of the database shortly in response to some work we've been doing with it. And what this a version is basically a minor change to the database. So in this case, we're going to be doing a couple things. Um, one is originally I coded this so that we infilled missing values for when trees died. Um, so if a tree died in year two, all the subsequent years, we considered it to be dead. And one thing we found was that it, th doing that kind of removed the information of when these trees were sampled. And I think we're going to revise in this version of the database and not do that infilling and leave it to the user to decide how to deal with zombie trees, so trees that died and came back alive. There aren't that many of them, but they do exist in there. Um, and then how to use the data on when the observations in the field, true observations took place, and to choose themselves of whether or not to fill in missing variables. From there, we can also publish new additions. And it, it's always been our intention that this be a living database. When we built it, we did a lot of cleaning and processing of the data ourselves for new additions with new data sets. We're going to ask for contributors, follow the formatting um, that's already set up for the database in terms of values that are allowed and column names. And then we've de I'm working on developing our scripts to rapidly test the QAQC of new data. If you're interested in contributing new data or doing targeted data collection, please feel free to contact me or Sharon Hood about the database. And just some big picture things in terms of looking forward. I'm almost out of time, but I think I'd say thinking about traits and the scope in terms of the geography of data is stuff we want to do in the future as well. <laughs>
So I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. All right. So we're we're near. Um, I think one quick question um, would would be okay. Is there uh, Sama? Is there anything? Nothing yet on Whova. Okay. I think I'm going to say. Can I jump in with one quick one for you? Please. Yeah, Tucker. Uh, have you have you used the? I know you've um, used the database to look at different aspects of what's contributing to the uncertainty in mortality predictions. Um, and I'm curious if you've looked at like regional differences or elevational differences, um, sort of these site level, if site level uh, factors are contributing to that. Yeah, and for Phil's talk, he's gonna talk a little bit about climate and that started to get into the questions of fire to fire variation. And climate difference in the burning environment or pre-fire climate might be one source of variation. I did try to start to dig into like the bioclimatic space. And I have to say, I feel like we still don't have a large enough sample size to disentangle that bioclimatic space out despite all these samples. So that may seem like an unsatisfactory answer with such a big database, but believe it or not, we still need more samples. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Good. And, and with that, thank you, Alina, and thanks for sort of setting up uh, the coming talks. Um, so next up is, is um, uh, Phil uh, and Mangtum. And uh, so take it, take it away, Phil. Good afternoon, I'm Phil Van Mankin. I'm a research ecologist with the US Geological Survey in Arcata, California. And today I'll be talking about climatic stress and post-fire tree mortality for common conifers in North America. I'd first like to thank Sharon and Elena for putting this special session together. And I'd also like to note that this work is really the product of a group effort from Elena, Micah Wright, Tim Shearman, Morgan Barner, and Sharon Hood along with the collected data from just a lot of places. I'd also like to acknowledge our funders, uh, especially the Joint Fire Science Program. This is an image of the 2016 rough fire in the Sierra National Forest in California. It's making a run through a drought impacted mixed conifer stand. Note the standing dead trees from a recent high severity drought. To me, this image is really emblematic of some of the challenges we are currently facing with forest management in California and across the West. We're seeing increasing fire frequency, size, and sometimes increasing fire severity. The recent Dixie Fire and Caldor Fire in California are two immediate examples. Why? We have over a century of fire exclusion that's led to high surface fuel loads and the infilling of small trees, and these are fuels for fire. In addition, warming trends have led to drier fuels that more readily carry fire. But wait, it gets worse. So we might also be seeing increasing fire severity just from the drought effects alone. Why might this be? Let's take a little detour and think about how stress and tree mortality work in unburned forest. So typically there's a conceptual model called the decline spiral. In this case, I've shown an image of the decline funnel. And what this is saying is that the health of an individual tree declines, the risk of death increases, requiring less potent disturbances to lead to mortality. As conditions change, trees may recover and move back up the spiral, which are the white arrows there. However, the further a tree declines down the spiral, the less likely it is to recover, the fading white arrows here, until there's no escape and the tree dies. So we can also think about the decline spiral model in terms of individual tree vigor, which is shown here along the y-axis, and how it responds to stress over time along the x-axis. So if we have a high vigor tree that is exposed to a disturbance, such as fire, it might lose some of its vigor, but it might bounce back and continue on its way. If we have a low vigor tree and it's exposed to that same stress, it might not recover, and eventually its vigor declines until it's dead. Using pre-fire diameter growth rate as an index of tree vigor, we do have some 
evidence suggesting that pre-fire tree condition affects post-fire mortality outcomes. So on the left, we have a response surface showing the percent volume crown scorched of white fir in the Sierra Nevada and its probability of mortality over five years following fire. What we can see is that the pre-fire diameter growth rate has some effect on that relationship. That is, faster growing trees tend to die less frequently than slow growing trees. The dark line shows an unburned stand uh, response curve. So they're showing similar sorts of responses to growth. That is, slow growing trees tend to die more frequently in both burned and unburned stands. We can also look at a path diagram for fire-caused tree mortality, in this case for white fir. And what we can see here is that the things that affect growth rate, that variable labeled GROW10, is affected by the tree's diameter, the amount of local competition, and the average vapor pressure deficit over the last 10 years. And that growth rate affects post-fire tree mortality. And what we can see is that uh, percent crown volume scorched and char height also affect tree mortality, but also that pre-fire growth rate. We can also model this relationship directly as well, looking at how climatic stress affects post-fire tree mortality. And here we've done this in an earlier study using data from the National Park Service and U.S. Forest Service from 18 sites from more than 250 plots and 7,000 trees in stands dominated by ponderosa pine and white fir. And what we found was that sure enough, uh, the amount of crown volume scorch affects your post-fire tree mortality probability, but that that relationship was affected by what we called relative deficit, which was the five-year pre-fire climatic water deficit relative to a 30-year average. And so what we found was that given a same amount of crown volume scorch, trees in stressful conditions were more likely to die post-fire than trees that were in less stressful conditions. We were interested to see if this pattern held up when using a much larger sample. And for this, we turned to the fire and tree mortality database. And we limited observations to trees that had live dead status recorded within five years post-fire. Trees also needed to have crown volume scorched measured directly in the field, that is not based on calculated measurements. They also needed to have a presence or absence of bark char listed. And from this, we had over 160,000 individual trees from 409 fires occurring between 1981 and 2016. And we looked at the four main species, that is Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, white fir, and lodgepole pine. For each fire, we derived climate from terra climate. Specifically, we looked at minimum and maximum temperatures, precipitation, vapor pressure deficit, Palmer drought severity index, and the climatic water deficit. And these were summarized 10, 5, 3, and 1 year pre-fire, and also 5, 3, and 1 year post-fire. We also used 30 year averages to create anomalies and z-scores each one of these individual fires. Because of the large number of climate variables that we considered, we also needed some methods for data reduction. For this, we had a couple of different approaches. First, we used principal components analysis to look at variation among the climate variables. And then within the climate predictors, we looked at correlations. And then we removed highly correlated variables and variables with the weakest Spearman's rank correlation with fire scale mortality. Then we looked at random forest models predicting individual tree mortality based on crown volume scorched, bark thickness, and bark char in a suite of climate variables. And for this, we're predicting five year mortality. And we had a hurdle model approach where we considered initially the first year mortality following fire. And then we modeled mortality up to five years post fire. Our exploratory analysis with random forests showed that crown volume scorch explained most of the variance. And here we can see the predicted outcome of crown volume scorch and bark thickness on post-fire tree mortality, with lighter colors showing higher probabilities of post-fire tree mortality. So this is simply showing that higher levels of crown volume scorch with thin bark predict high levels of post-fire tree mortality.
We can also use these same random forest models to look at the effects of climate on post-fire tree mortality. In the middle plot, we have the relationship of crown volume scorch and the one-year pre-fire climatic water deficit anomaly. And what this is showing is that pretty much across the board of crown volume scorch, trees that were growing in stressful conditions, as measured by this climatic water deficit anomaly, had higher probabilities of mortality following fire. This is also true if you look at that relationship with bark thickness, climatic water deficit, and the probability of mortality. So what this is really saying is that given the same amounts of tree injury caused by fire, that trees found in stressful conditions are more likely to die. We can also use the random forest models to understand the relative importance of each one of the predictor variables in describing post-fire tree mortality probabilities. Here we can see that far and away crown scorch was the most important predictor variable, but we had similar levels of explanatory power for bark thickness, and in this case, the one-year pre-fire climatic water deficit anomaly. Our index of bull char explained relatively little. The random forest model found that the one-year or the three-year pre-fire climatic water deficit were consistently important predictors. They're also highly correlated with each other. We also found with the random forest models that different species had different re relationships to fire injury, especially crown volume scorch, even after accounting for species-specific differences in bark thickness. So we took that information and used it to create a generalized nonlinear mixed model with random effects being the fire and plot location where we had it. Probabilities of survival were penalized by the observation interval length. That is, the longer the observation period was, the less likely an individual tree was to survive. And for the linear predictors, we looked at bark thickness, crown volume scorch, bull char height, climatic water deficit, and an interaction between crown volume scorch and climatic water deficit, and also a dummy variable for species identity. The model was fit using STAN with four chains using 2000 iterations for each chain. And we assessed model convergence with visual inspections of trace plots and making sure that the R hat value was below 1.05 for all the parameters. And here are posterior distributions for that fitted model. Crown volume scorch and bull char, not surprisingly, were associated with higher mortality. Bark thickness was associated with lower mortality. And we also found a role for the pre-fire climatic water deficit anomaly that was associated with higher mortality probabilities. We also found a negative interaction with crown volume scorch and the climatic water deficit anomaly. Our model also suggested large differences among species independent of allometric relationships with bark thickness. The figure shows that relative to Douglas fir, white fir had higher mortality probabilities, ponderosa pine had lower mortality probabilities, and lodgepole pine also had higher mortality probabilities. So how well did this model fit the data? To assess this, we left out approximately a third of our data as testing data and calculated the AUC and the Breer score. The Breer score is equivalent to the mean squared error as applied to the predicted probabilities. Therefore, the lower the Breer score is for a set of predictions, the better the predictions are calibrated. The figure highlights model predictions with the species terms and without the species terms. What we're seeing under both conditions that the AUC was approximately 0.9, suggesting excellent discrimination and the Breer score is also quite low, which suggests good calibration under both models. To help understand what our model was saying, we created a series of prediction plots varying the intensity of the pre-fire climatic water deficit. These conditions included the historical climatic water deficit derived from Terra climate, but also the pre-fire climatic water deficit depicted under increasing temperature, two degrees and four degrees Celsius. So here's a prediction plot depicting the interaction between crown volume scorch and pre-fire climatic water deficit. We have crown volume scorch on the x-axis 
and predicted probability of mortality on the link scale for ponderosa pine on the y-axis. The blue line shows the expected mortality under the historical climatic water deficit. The red line shows the expected mortality under more stressful conditions where the temperature is increased by four degrees. What this demonstrates is that the effect of pre-fire climatic water deficit is most pronounced for trees with low levels of crown scorch. We can also use these prediction plots to help visualize differences among species. We have crown scorch on the x-axis and the predicted probability of mortality on the y-axis. And each one of the panels shows the species specific response to changing the climatic water deficit scenario. And what this figure highlights is that we'd expect to see more pronounced responses for ponderosa pine and white fir. This figure shows the distributions of the four species used in our study with points representing where we have mortality response data. The points are colored by the expected crown volume scorch mortality response with rows showing differences in this response under the historical climatic water deficit or under conditions where temperatures are elevated. Particularly for Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, and white fir, our model indicates that lower amounts of crown scorch will be needed to cause mortality as temperatures increase, especially in arid locations, shown here towards the bottom. So what does it all mean? First, our data suggests that mortality processes in both disturbed and undisturbed stands are not fundamentally different but can be conceptually unified under the decline spiral model. Our demonstration that pre-fire water deficit is useful for predicting post-fire mortality is simply an application of the decline spiral model in a novel context. Our results imply that trees already experiencing long-term stress, as measured by climatic water deficit anomaly, have higher mortality probabilities when challenged with additional fire-related damage. Although the decline spiral model of tree death is intuitive, empirical demonstrations of it are rare. An interesting implication of our findings is that various stressors could lead to a de facto increase in fire severity without corresponding increases in fire intensity. For example, here are the stress complexes put together by Littell et al. for mixed conifer forests in California. And what this shows is the various stressors that can eventually affect tree mortality ranging from high temperatures and droughts, fire exclusion, ozone. Eventually, this leads to tree mortality, which in turn causes increased fuel accumulation, which might lead to large and severe fires. Our results suggest that there might be an additional pathway where higher temperatures and more severe and extended droughts lead directly to more severe fires if fire severity is measured in terms of tree mortality. The final take home is that there's a lot we still don't understand. We only considered relationships among four species, and obviously there's a lot of additional species out there. I think it'd be particularly interesting to look at angiosperms, where there might be fundamental differences in relationships between fire caused injuries and subsequent post fire mortality. And while we had a large data set, we still did not cover the entire range of some widely distributed species, such as ponderosa pine. It's possible that individuals in the hot, dry, trailing edge of their distribution may be more sensitive to the effects of moisture deficits. I'd like to emphasize that these results were taken from observational data. We really need experimental results to help pin down some of these relationships. For example, there's a recent study that found well-watered ponderosa pine seedlings survived moderate intensity fire, while drought stress seedlings did not. However, we can look towards a counterexample using drought deciduous larch that didn't find this pattern. We simply need more of these kinds of studies to help understand what's going on. Widely used planning tools currently only consider crown scorch and bark thickness to predict tree mortality. It may be early to start including climate and fire mortality relationships into these tools, but with expected increases in temperature and drought, this may become a more important consideration in the future. And with that, I'll close and I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, Phil. That was nicely done. Um, so we're, we want to get back on track. We're a little, there's, there's less than a minute. So any, any quick questions? Sama, do you have anything on the chat? 
Nothing that's come in for Phil, but we'll keep watching and we can roll into the next speaker and come back to it if anybody has any questions in there. Okay, good. Well, uh, getting back on track here, um, our next next up is uh, Tim Shearman. And uh, so please take it away, Tim. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for joining me poolside at the uh, Sandestin Resort. And um, I'm going to share my screen. All right. So I'm gonna continue uh, this morbid discussion on tree mortality. And um, first I'm gonna start off uh, by thanking all of my co-authors here, who I'm sure everybody here is probably familiar with their work, Morgan, Sharon, Alina, Phil, who we just heard, and Micah. Uh, they've all helped me um, kind of wrap my brain around these models that I'm gonna be talking about. And so uh, I'm just talking about empirical models here. And because as Alina's talk earlier today said, um, this is these are the type of models that are currently available to uh, for decision makers and uh, land managers. And for tree mortality, they generally, um, are in the form of logistic regression. So, uh, and it makes perfect sense if you have sort of a uh, binary response, the tree's either alive or dead, and you have some predictor or a linear combination of predictors, you can fit this uh, linear regression formula and come up with a model that can help predict new observations. And uh, this paper by Willie et al. does a nice job reviewing uh, logistic regression uh, models for post fire tree mortality. But what generally uh, happens in the data that's used to fit these models is you have uh, one of two scenarios usually is either you have most of your trees survive and you only have a few dead trees, which is the case in, especially in the Southeast when it's prescribed fire and there's surface fires, or on the opposite hand, you have serious or uh, severe fire where most of your trees die and you don't have a lot of live um, trees. And so you have this sort of imbalance of uh, classes. And what we showed in our paper a couple of years back, um, when you use logistic regression in these imbalanced cases, so here we um, did a simulated uh, different mortality rates. And for logistic regression, if you have low, so it's, this goes from 10% mortality to 90% mortality, and at the low mortality scale, your models are really good at predicting live trees, which trees are gonna be alive, but they're pretty poor at predicting dead trees. And these sort of swap, and when you get to that high mortality side, you're no longer really able to predict live trees, but you can predict dead trees pretty well. And so there's, there's a bias in uh, your predictions towards whatever the majority class is. And we propose this solution of these balanced random forests um, to uh, it's one of uh, some a number of possible solutions, but uh, the balanced random forest could alleviate this bias in prediction. And so random forests have been used um, a lot more frequently um, in our field now. Uh, so basically they're just a, um, extension of classification and regression trees, where instead of having one uh, classification tree, you have a sort of forest of them. And in each one, there's a random set of observations and predictors, and that randomness sort of alleviates some of the over, um, overfitting that regular cart models tend to have. So in a balanced random forest, each one of these trees in the forest has a an equal number of alive and dead stems when it's being fit. So regardless of what models you are using, you have a choice of predictors and they come in a variety of different flavors. So 
We have fire injury, um, which Alina mentioned is crown scorch is one of the consistently one of the best predictors and can either be as a percentage of the total crown or uh, maybe the crown length scorch. There's different ways to measure it. And in char is another one which has a variety of different measurements. Could be either the maximum height of char, the average, or the percent of the total height of the tree. So there's no um, sort of standard weight measurement. And we have fire defense predictors, which is mainly bark thickness, which varies between species, as we can see here with these turkey oak cross sections compared to the sand live oak in the bottom right here. And uh, it also changes based on diameter of the tree. And in most models, the actual bark thickness is estimated based on diameter using some linear um, formula, which could be a whole nother talk about issues with that. Some less common uh, predictors, we have post-fire events such as bark beetles, and that's usually uh, just the presence of absence of evidence such as pitch tubes. And as we just heard from Phil's talk uh, about pre and post-fire climate, that's probably even uh, less commonly used, but, um, and this is not an exhaustive list. You can also use you know, um, like pre-fire fuel loads or duff consumption, and the list goes on. And so all these predictors are designed to predict um, the status of a new, new data. So either a tree is going to be alive or dead. And that kind of um, brings us to the question of when are we talking about? So if we're talking about uh, immediate post-fire mortality that uh, we're considering first order of fire effects, um, and or are we looking at later mortality, delayed mortality, second order fire effects. So the post-fire mortality can be elevated above background, you know, regular mortality over, there's been studies documented over 10 years. Um, so when we're talking about uh, is important when this tree has died, but most models, logistic regression models are based on a single point in time. So the tree is dead, usually somewhere between one and five years, often three is like the sweet spot for most models. And so that's talking, looking at cumulative mortality. So it's all the trees that died from the fire, since the fire to whenever that point that they're assessed at. And so we kind of blur that line of when do uh, first order fire effects end and second order fire effects begin. So, that kind of brought us to these research questions where we want to know are models that are fit to these cumulative uh, mortality, are they sensitive to when the tree is actually dying? So in other words, if we look at the error in those models, is it the same regardless of when the tree died or is the error higher in later years versus early years? Um, we also want to know, how these predictor variables change over time. So if we're considering just first order fire effects, um, if we want fire damage, we expect that, we might expect that um, those predictors would be important in early uh, mortality. And as second order effects kind of take over the later, the importance should decline for fire damage. And uh, last, we want to know is, are the trees sensitive to um, the different crown and bowl injuries? So are trees that are getting more scorched dying earlier or later? And how does that differ between species, which is a question we're always interested in. And so we use the fire and tree mortality database, which Alina did a good review over um, in the beginning of this session. And we, like Alina said, we had to kind of reduce it because couldn't use all 142 species. So we kind of settled on uh, eight focal species. So we have uh, white fir, grand fir, incense cedar, western larch, lodgepole pine, uh, sugar pine, ponderosa pine, and Douglas fir. And so here is a map where the yellow circles are 
the different fires where we have data from, and they're overlaid onto the ranges of the different species. So we have pretty good coverage across the range of every of all our species. And these were uh, looking at observations between one and five years post fire. So some had uh, observations every year, some only had from one year, and some had everything in between. So we started uh, by fitting a cumulative random forest model, a balanced round, random forest, where we had a tree status, it was either alive or dead, and it was a function of uh, crown volume scorch as a percent, bowl char as a percent of total height, and diameter. So we're looking at fire damage and protection. And we did a separate model for each species and a separate model for each post-fire year. So these variables were measured, scorch, char, and diameter were measured right after the fire, right? You have to measure scorch pretty quick soon after the fire. But the tree status was not necessarily measured at the same time. Sometimes it was measured year one, year two, year three, and so on. Um, and we use uh, cross-validation to see the performance of the models and how, how they did. And again, this was cumulative mortality. So at five years, we're looking at all the trees that died right after the fire up till five years. And if we look at the accuracy, so here we have um, the solid line is total accuracy. The dashed line is uh, the ability of the model to predict live trees. And the dotted line is uh, the ability to predict dead trees. And they look pretty good. They, they do decline most for most species, um, except for freaking incense cedar. It looks amazing, like, no matter when. Um, but in Ponderosa, you know, the predictability to pre predict dead trees kind of goes to the upper 60s, maybe 70%. These look good. But if we take a look at the error, um, so these are just dead trees. Uh, we can see that um, we have trees that died in year one and trees that died between years two and five. So we grouped them two to five together to kind of increase our sample because sometimes we weren't sure exactly when. So for example, if the tree was measured, uh, surveyed in year one and it was alive, and maybe it was only surveyed in year five and it was dead, we don't know when it died. We know it died sometime after year one. So we sort of group these together and we see that all the models are pretty, bad at predicting the later death, especially if we look back at incense cedar, which was looked so great before, but now it's 75% of it between no matter what model you use is wrong at predicting these later deaths. And the reason why it looked so great before was because most of the trees actually died in the year, first year. Um, so if we, look at importance values. So this is the value of if a va variable is important, then if we replace that variable with just random numbers, then we would expect accuracy to go down. And the amount that goes down is the importance. So uh, the red is scorch, um, the orange is diameter, and black is bowl char. And so this is importance for the solid line being uh, dead trees and the dashed line being live trees. And so for white fir example, for example, scorch in year one is, you know, almost 40%. That's how uh, important it is. So if we removed scorch, our accuracy would go down by 40%. And we see that um, over these models, the First of all, scorch is the most important variable, like we already kind of knew, but it also declines for most species, especially for dead trees. Uh, Ponderosa pine is a good example of the decline from almost 50% down to maybe about 15. 
So this is an indication that um, maybe these fire damage aren't as good as predicting later on, and maybe we might need more var predictor variables such as uh, like beetles or, or um, climate might be helpful. So we tried a, a different uh, class where we, um, the beauty about random forest models is it doesn't have to be just a binary response. So here we made random forest models where we had live, dead in year one or dead in years two through five. And um, we used the same predictors. Again, we had separate model for each species and we did cross validation. But now we have um, models that if we looked at, this is total accuracy between live trees, uh, all the models for each color here is a different species. They're all okay at predicting live. They're really good at predicting dead in the first year. And they're kind of mixed between two through five and five. Um, so we can look at partial dependence plots and I probably could have used all my time to look at these plots, but unfortunately I don't have time but we can definitely see differences in species. So this is where the model would predict uh, dead year one, dead two through five or live. And the transparency is that probability. So a couple things to note, like, so Ponderosa, we see that U-shape um, survival. So medium, this is diameter on the Y-axis. So intermediate sized trees have higher survival. Uh, with crown scorch. And then we can continue that through, um, this is crown volume scorch and bull char. We see a large bull pine is just gonna die from most fires. Uh, it's not really good at resisting fires. And um, if we look at the last one, this is bull char and diameter, um, which you can see these are all really transparent. So it's, the probability is really low, but these were very low. Um, importance these these predictors but so that kind of changes things up so to uh wrap things up we have um mortality models uh, they do seem to be biased uh, if they're cumulative uh, on the first year and we might need these secondary fire effects or we might need these other predictors to help with the delayed mortality and we definitely see differences among species and now what we're going to do is look at how spatial arrangements of scorch um, might influence it. Because right now the models just think of a species, a tree alone in a forest with nothing else around it. Um, and how would ignition pattern might affect these scorch? And I guess I'll leave it right there since I'm pretty much out of time. So. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Tim. That was... Uh... Good data. All right. Um, Sam, are there any questions in the chat? No questions in the chat. Um, so, but we do have time, I think, for a question or two if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question. Yeah, I, I don't know the, the, the answer to this. Otherwise, I wouldn't ask it, I guess. But so, Crown Scorch you know, has kind of combines, you know, tree characteristics, but also fire behavior characteristics. And may maybe that's why it's such a good predictor. Whereas bark thickness is only a sort of a tree characteristic. It doesn't hold any information on, on, on the fire. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I wonder if there's any way to uh, combine bark thickness and bark char in, in some way into a single variable. Um, maybe that's more explanatory. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's, bark char is such a weird thing because it's not necessarily telling you how much heat that like the cambium's gonna getting, right? It's just an indicator of maybe it's hotter there because it got char, but. It, right, and it's so, it's only on one side of the tree often. Right. Yeah, so we wanted Morgan and I talked about um, how we wanted to do something more with char and kind of tease out some of 
first of all, standardize like what's important, like percent of total height is kind of a weird way to look at char because it for a tall tree versus a medium sized tree, you could have the same char height, but that percent would be different, right? So. Right, yeah, good. Um, well, we're, we're out of time here. Um, thanks a lot, Tim. And uh, so next up, um, we have Christian, uh, Kristen Shive. And so uh, take it away, Kristen. Thanks. All right, I'm gonna hope that the, I can do the magic here and share the right screen. Let's see, so please let me know if you're not seeing, um, if you're seeing presenter view or something. It looks good, okay, great. So um, I'm gonna present today, I currently work with the Nature Conservancy, but this is some work that I initiated in 2018 when I was still with Save the Redwoods League. And this paper is currently under review and I wanna give a shout out to my co-authors here um, from both the League and from the Forest Service. And broadly, I'm gonna be talking a lot about, you know, about giant sequoia and recent fire effects. And so, Big, some big picture um, pieces of info about giant sequoia. To start, there are about 70 groves, depending if you're a lumper or a splitter. And you can see those here in blue or that bluish color. They are restricted to the western slope of the Sierra Nevada and they co-occur within the mixed conifer forest. They're limited to about 28,000 acres. About 20% of that was um, cut when European settlers first arrived in terms of old growth. They're also an incredibly exceptional species. If you haven't had the um, uh, opportunity to see them, I encourage you to get out there and do so. They're pretty amazing. They have really exceptional longevity. The oldest one we know of is uh, just a little over 3,000 years old, but many of them are multi-millennial, multi-millennials. They're also the most massive clonal, non-clonal organisms on Earth. So the largest one we know of is 11 meters in diameter and over 80 meters in height. So really um, incredible organisms. And they're also highly fire adapted in many ways, but you know, a couple of their key traits that I would point to, you can kind of see in the picture is they have incredibly thick bark, these 60 centimeters or more. Um, they also have a really tall height to live crown, so that potential to um, escape the surface fire. And they are also semi serotonous They hang onto those cones and can do a massive seed release once a fire comes through. What's also cool about the species is that it gives us some of the oldest fire history records that we have. And so there's some work that's been done by Tom Swetnam and others that created a really robust 1400 year fire history across five of those different groves. Um, their individual tree records go back even longer than that, but that's sort of what he selected for having, having a really robust record to look across the groves. And when you zoom in all the way you know, to the tree and the grove level, what you see is fire is very frequent historically, big surprise um, for those of you who understand the, these Western Sierra and Nevada systems. The tree scale, you could see fire as frequently as every 15 years. But if you scale up to the grove, because fires were very heterogeneous and patchy, every two years there might be fire somewhere in a grove. And I think one of the coolest things that we, comes out of that is that the longest fire-free interval that Tom documented was 30 years, which to me just points to how much of an anomaly the fire exclusion era really is. So this photo is from Mariposa Grove in Yosemite. And you can see it's a very open stand. This is that same place in 1970. Um, I, I couldn't dig up the more recent picture of that stand, but I um, luckily in this stand, the National Park Service has done a ton of work to prescribe burn and really restore the structure of this place. That's actually what you're seeing behind me as well. But most groves um, before the recent fires looked more like this because the majority of groves hadn't burned in over a hundred years. Okay, so thinking about trends through time, this is showing um, you've got acres burned on the y-axis, and then the dates are on the x-axis there, and it's showing the last hundred years of fire activity within groves. And you can see that since 2015, there's been a huge increase in the amount of fire, and, we, and it's been about 80% of the whole range has burned since that time. 
But I'm going to back up a little bit and really focus on a couple fires or one fire from 2015 and two from 2017 um, that were really huge and kind of unprecedented when they started and what at the time we thought were huge patches of high severity. And so we were really you know, curious to try to understand those effects better. Specifically, we had three um, broad questions we were interested in. One was the most basic, what are the mortality rates for large sequoias in high and moderate severity areas with that high and moderate being sort of designated um, by remote sensing maps? You know, we know obviously there would be some mortality there, but given their exceptional fire resilience, we just really weren't sure how much because these fires were, um, this type of burning is really new for the species um, in recent times. Then we also looked at what tree characteristics and topographic variables were linked with mortality for all the fire areas. What's noticeably absent is everything that um, was just talked about in the last talk, all the first order fire effects. We didn't include it for the model that had all three fire areas because one of them we visited five years post fire and we were a little bit, um, we didn't feel like our estimates of things like crown scorch and torch were very reliable. So this is just sort of a broad brush look at where trees were dying. But then we also have one grove, Black Mountain Grove, where we, um, we were there immediately or one year after the fire, and then we tracked trees for three years. And so we can look at delayed mortality and some of those um, and, build, and build some of those predictive models based on first order fire effects. And then we'll also look really quickly at how that compares with the models that already exist. Okay, so. In terms of our study sites, again, I'm gonna rewind the clock. So 2015, there was the rough fire that burned in Giant Sequoia National Monument and Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park. We limited ourselves to groves that were in old growth and were accessible by road. And so we ended up pretty much focusing in Giant Sequoia National Monument with those three groves listed there. For the Nelder Grove burned in the 2017 railroad fire. So we also surveyed that. And then here is Black Mountain Grove where we additionally looked at delayed mortality also from 2017. So in terms of field methods, here's an example of um, a grove area. This is Black Mountain Grove and laid over a severity map where red is high severity and the orange is moderate. And so again, we went to those areas that we could access where we had these, um, where we expected more severe fire effects. And that was old growth. And so at each tree, we recorded a lot of the basics, you know, diameter of rest height, height, height to light crown, presence of a cat face, some topographic variables. And then of course, all those first order fire effects that were just described, such as the amount of crown scorch, which is that where you get the browned needles from the heat of a surface fire um, and crown torch, which complete loss of canopy, which we then combined into a um, total crown damage variable and bowl char percent of height, et cetera. Okay, so in terms of what we found, um, in the mortality rates for large sequoias, which again, we defined as 1.2 meters or greater. Um, well, first of all, for all of our fires, I should say, we surveyed 459 large sequoias. That's what we found. And we did a complete census in those areas that I highlighted. And just to give you a sense of um, those trees, the mean size was about 300 centimeters, but the range was anywhere from 124 to 950. So we had a pretty big range with a lot of very, very large trees. And the mean height was about 62 meters. I think it's worth noting here just that we observed over of 30 trees that had over 90% crown torch or full crown consumption. And again, given their exceptional height, when we first went out to survey these, that was pretty surprising. Most of the people who you know, manage and study sequoias didn't quite expect such severe effects in these trees. 41% of that you know, total 460 um, large sequoias were dead by 2020. And when we looked at mortality by severity class as defined by the composite burn index, and within the high severity, uh, we had the sort of the mean between the three fires was 84% of the trees were killed, but that ranged within individual fire from 75%. Um, and the two of fires were at about that. And then one of the fires, we had 100% mortality in the high severity. So in, in moderate, it was significantly lower, 28%. Um, and that ranged though, again, anywhere from 14 to 45%, depending on which fire you were in. 
Okay, so in terms of um, those individual tree characteristics and topographic variables um, that could help predict mortality for all the fire areas, which again, we're sort of leaving out the first order fire effects for now because we lacked that data in the rough fire. Um, our potential variables were those that you see here. Uh, we also, I forgot to add there, but we also did look at um, climatic water deficit and um, annual precipitation. And what we found um, was that the three most important were cat face, crown ratio, and elevation. And quickly, I just want to note this, um, what a cat face is, for those of you who might not know. So this sort of basal hollow that you see at the bottom of many giant sequoias, it can get quite large. Um, these are initiated by some initial injury, usually fire, and then over the years, successive fires continue to open these areas. And we think there's a few reasons that this could be related to, um, that this, there, there are a few reasons that this is a good predictor of mortality. And one is that all of that area is basically, you've gotten down to dead wood. And so there's not, there's no cambium there. So the tree overall just has a lot less cambium to work with. They also have the potential to funnel fire up to the crown. And so um, that alone, you know, from all, most firefighters know that when you're working on a fire in Giant Square in particular, you really need to keep fire out of there because it can be very hard then um, to contain fire after that, after it gets um, established up in the crown. And then lastly, um, you know, you also have much thinner bark at the edges of where this tree is continually trying to heal. So I think that's one of the reasons that um, it came up so important in terms of crown ratio and elevation. So here you see crown ratio with the three study areas um, on, sorry, it's elevation on the y-axis and the three study areas on the x-axis. And you can see in general, it's the lower elevation trees that were killed shown in um, that gray color with the live trees in white. I wanna note that we did look at um, climatic water deficit as well, thinking back to Phil's talk and I think that is some of what is being picked up here is that these are gonna be drier sites uh, lower down. So maybe things burned a little hotter, but also maybe the recovery potential, you know, it was, they were just trying to recover in more stressful conditions. But elevation uh, was a much better predictor than climatic water deficit. And I think part of that is just the scale at which we have um, the data for both of those. And it's much finer scale for, for elevation. And we don't have quite the spread that um, Phil had in terms of values for climatic water deficit, given our small sample area. Okay, so with crown ratio, this is basically what percent of the tree's total height is uh, you know, made up of a crown. And you can see that dead trees generally had lower crown ratios, which I think just gets at um, trees that were kind of you know, on the struggle bus already. If they're just, if, if you've seen a lot of giant sequoias, you know that um, they can get very scraggly crowns after you know millennia of repeated fire injuries. And I think that those were, what we're seeing is that those are a little bit more susceptible. And that makes sense because if you don't have much crown to begin with, um, you know, getting hit by fire, even if it's 90%, some, it's gonna affect you more. Okay, so lastly, I wanted our, our third question what first order fire effects best predict delayed mortality at Black Mountain? Um, I wanna emphasize here that some of the other studies that we've been seeing that are trying to build these um, predictive models on delayed mortality rely on thousands of trees. At Black Mountain, we had 200 or 205, something like that. So, you know, these are limited. It's a, it's a limited study, but I think it, it gives us a good first blush at what's going on. And basically like, Almost every other study looking at this, we found that total crown damage was incredibly important. Um, but the other thing we found was, again, that presence of a cat face, which hasn't really appeared in, in those models previously. And one thing that I would note is if you, um, let's see if I get my pointer, um, you know, the difference is we've got total crown damage here on the y-axis and then showing live and dead by presence or absence of a cat face. And, the number of samples um, defines the box width. And what you can see is in live, we have relatively similar um, numbers with or without a cat face. But for dead, there are far more actually that had a cat face that did not. And so it's, it's really, um, it really stood out as a very important predictor. And when we compared models with and without it, it was a significant improvement. Okay, and so 
In terms of what the thresholds for crown damage might be, we looked at them for both you know, um, cat face and, and no cat face. And if we assume that 50% probability of mortality means that you're likely to die, you see that with a cat face, sequoias can withstand about 85% crown damage. And without, they can withstand up to 90, 95% crown damage. I think even if you used a higher threshold for your probability of mortality, you would get a pretty similar result because those curves are really steep at that point. So then we compared these to the existing models, of which there are two. And the first comes from Stevens and Finney, where they looked at um, much smaller sequoias, so less than a meter diameter. And, um, and what they found, this, this was a study from 2002, um, and what they found the best predictor was strictly percent crown volume scorch. The other place that there's an existing model is in FOFEM, the first order fire effects model, but so many of the, um, so much of the data that has been presented in the session today is used to feed into this. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a model that managers use to predict mortality from prescribed fire or to consider what they might need to do for harvest operations. And in this one, it's percent crown volume scorch and bark thickness. But the bark thickness isn't speci actually specific to sequoia. It uses the bark, bark thickness for Port Orford cedar. And so when we compare them, I'm showing specificity and sensitivity here, where specificity is the modeled, the model predicted live versus total actual live. And you can see that they all are pretty similar in their terms of their performance. But when you look at sensitivity, which is that model predicted dead over total dead, which is really, frankly, what people are really concerned about in Sequoia right now, the potential loss of these ancient trees, um, our model did quite a bit better than the existing models. Now, this is a little bit unfair because we're, we used our data to build our model. Um, and obviously, an independent data set would be better. But I suspect this, that the inclusion of a cat face will sort of stick as an important predictor here. Okay, I'm running over here, but um, really quickly, I just want to kind of put these wildfires in context and talk also about how we've been able to use this data. So this work is from um, a paper that we're just starting to prepare. Um, but as I said, you know, in 2015 and 2017, we had about almost 700 acres. And I apologize, I did not put these in the hectares. I have a mental block on, on acres specifically. For some reason, I cannot think in hectares. Um, so about 700 acres burned in these two fires that we we're really concerned about. And that has been really trumped in the last couple of years in terms of amount of area burned in giant sequoia and the amount of high severity. So we're now up to about 4,500 acres of high severity in sequoia. And um, that's 16% of the range. It's too soon to know exactly what the extent of those impacts were, but because we had mortality rates from these prior fires, we were able to estimate that last year's fires may have taken out 10 to 14 percent of all large sequoias across the range. This year's fires, maybe three to five percent, 13 to 19 percent. Like these are really, this is a really alarming trend. And so I'll just wrap up by saying that, you know, where do we go from here? I, I think that we have to we have to race to the little bit of unburned that's left and get some prescribed fire on the ground so that we can make those stands more resilient. But I also think we need to focus on the potentially beneficial acres that occurred in these recent wildfires, of which there's a lot, maybe 18,000 acres. Of course, some of that moderate severity is actually going to be quite hot, uh, burned quite hot, quite high severity end of that, of that spectrum. Much of the undetected probably didn't burn at all, but we saw this picture here was an undetected change pixel from a recent fire. So, so yeah, not all of these are, are in perfect shape, but we can leverage these and try to you know, maintain resilience going forward. I see it as actually an opportunity. So anyway, with that, I just really wanna quickly thank Save the Redwoods League that funded all of this work, the Forest Service as collaborators, um, FRST, a consulting group that helped us with staffing, and then my employer. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, any, uh, Sam, any questions in the, in the chat. Yeah, we do have one from Liz who says, great talk, Kristen. Do you think wrapping the cat face trees would make a difference in mortality rates? Um, that's a great question. And I know on the KMP complex, I, I helped do the estimates and talked to a lot of folks up there where they did do that, like on General Sherman. And frankly, it's really probably not because all once an ember, if an ember gets under 
the wrap, which can happen. They're not, you can never perfectly seal it. Then you've actually created a little oven and you're actually sort of potentially making it worse. I do think though that scraping the base to try to keep fire out of those cat faces um, is something you can do in that sort of emergency protection mode. Awesome. We have an, we have another one here. Um, did you see mechanical failure in the cat face trees? We saw a few. Yeah. And, you know, to be honest, from prescribed fires, that's the way we thought they always died was that was the main thing. Um, so there were, I would think maybe, let's say less than 10 in the data set. Um, I'd have to look it up, but yeah, so there were a few, but it was definitely not the dominant mechanism. Great. Okay. All right. I think we're out of time. I'm, I, I've got questions. I'll, I'll catch up with you later. Um, okay. Thanks for the talk. Thank um, you. So, uh, Tucker, take it away. All right, thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, can you see my screen? I think so. I can't hear anyone, so I'll assume it's yes, working. Yes, looks great. Excellent. <laughs> um, yeah, hi and welcome. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uncertainty. Um, and specifically, I want to explore how thinking about uncertainty and explicitly incorporating it into our quantification of burned landscapes can make models more useful, um, even if we can't actually produce the uncertainty in a statistical sense. And the key idea that I hope to convey is that uncertainty is not simply prediction error that's best ignored. It's potentially explainable ecological variability. And that variability is actually really central to the ecological function that fire is providing. So the first source of uncertainty that I'll address stems out of the question, which trees will die after fire and which will thrive? Um, this ties right into many of the talks that we've been listening to today. Um, Post-fire mortality is a really complex process and there are a ton of ecological factors that mediate mortality in addition to direct fire damage. So examining where logistic mortality models do well and where they do not can teach us something about the importance of secondary factors. This can enhance our understanding of um, how fire kills trees. And the second type of uncertainty that I wanna talk about is the difference between fire severity on the ground and fire severity as measured from space. Severity maps are incredibly useful, but as anyone who's spent time walking around a post-fire landscape would notice, severity maps are not perfect. And I'll make the case that thinking about what satellites cannot see gives us a much more nuanced and ecologically relevant picture of the post-fire landscape. With each of these types of uncertainty, I'll talk about some ways to quantify it and specifically how we might quantify it in an ecologically relevant way. Um, and we'll dive into the causes of this uncertainty and I'll explore what it tells us about fire as an ecological process. And finally, I'll touch on a few ways we might be able to use our knowledge about this uncertainty and what's contributing to it to either improve the next generation of models or to enhance our ability to use the existing ones. Uh, so first, a quick overview of logistic mortality models um, that we've been talking about today. Um, so nothing particularly new here, um, but these models are the basis for um, the mortality predictions in FOFEM and the forest vegetation simulator. So they're super widely used. Um, and they're widely used because fire damage is an excellent predictor of mortality. Uh, prediction accuracy is generally well over 90%. Um, but the accuracy of these models is predicated on the relationship between fire damage and mortality risk remaining constant. Um, and in this novel world, climate change, um, that assumption is, is sort of more and more in question. Um, there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that climate and other factors might alter tree susceptibility to fire. Um, so I wanted to look at these covariates uh, to determine to what extent they might be contributing to some of the air in logistic mortality models. To explore sources of underlying prediction air, I used two longitudinal tree mortality data sets from the Sierra Nevada. The first of these was the Yosemite Forest Dynamics Plot, a large forest, dynam uh, forest tomography plot in an old growth white fir sugar pine forest in Yosemite National Park. The single big plot is 26 hectares in size, and it contained over 34,000 live trees before it burned in the Rim Fire in 2013. And then to expand the scope beyond the single plot, I combined the YFDP with 18 one hectare plots 
um, from the Sierra Nevada Forest Dynamics Plot Network, distributed throughout similar forest types in Sequoia, Kings Canyon, and Yosemite National Parks. This produced a combined data set comprising 50,000 trees from 19 different sites, including 23 years of annual mortality surveys and six different fire events between the years of 1990 and 2013. Each of the plots was stem mapped, so I was able to calculate neighborhood metrics for each individual tree. And the 23 year time span captured fire events that burned following both wet and dry periods. I built mortality models based on Crown Scorch alone, as with the models contained within FOFEM. And I compared these models to enhanced models that contain terms for either climate and local neighborhood crowding. For climate, I used three year pre fire climatic water deficit. And for neighborhood, I used uh, basal area within a, a variety of neighborhood radi radii around each tree. In this results figure, the dotted lines show the base model. The solid line shows the enhanced model, and the points represent observed proportion of mortality. As expected, base models did well, but there was significant improvement in the model performance with both climate and crowding models. The top row here shows the climate results. There is a positive trend, meaning that greater pre-fire climatic water deficit contributed to greater mortality risk, as we might expect. Um, but we can see from the points that this relationship wasn't always consistent. Um, there, is, there is a lot of variability around um, in individual plots. Um, so it appeared that something else is contributing to this difference in predicted versus actual mortality risk. And this might have been uh, one of the things that is probably missing is local neighborhood crowding. Um, so the bottom row is, is crowding effects. Um, this is also a really important mediator of post-fire mortality risk. Um, this was evident in the proportion of survival shown here, where trees in open neighborhoods had a notably greater chance of survival compared with trees in dense neighborhoods. To compare climate and local neighborhood directly, I put the two variables on dual x-axis. The big surprise of this study was that for trees with intermediate to high levels of fire damage, crowding actually mattered more than climate. Um, I think this, this, it's interesting that Phil pointed out earlier that climate was more important for trees with lower levels of uh, lower levels of ground scorch. Um, so that's perhaps one of the reasons for this sort of trade-off in the relative importance of climate crowding. Um, so for two generic trees with 50% crown scorch, a tree that burned under drought but was in an open neighborhood would actually have a greater chance of survival compared to a tree in a dense neighborhood that burned following a wetter pre-fire climate. So this is sort of a, a possible silver lining uh, when we think about the, um, the potentially negative effects of climate on fire severity and, and tree survival. Um, and the silver lining is that forest density is also a key factor and forest density is something that we can actually control. So reducing density may actually be able to compensate for some of the deleterious effects of climate at really fine scales. We specifically controlled for the effects of climate on fire intensity by partitioning trees into crown scorch categories because we were interested in how climate affects trees' ability to tolerate fire damage. Um, so these results don't reflect um, the more direct effects of climate on flame length and fire intensity, which are also contributing to greater in fire size and severity at broader scales. And with that, I want to scale up. Um, I want to shift gears and talk about uncertainty in the relationship between satellite drive fire severity and field-based metrics of severity. And I'm going to focus on tree mortality as the primary metric of field measured severity. Uh, because in forest, tree mortality is often the one thing that we're most interested in. So patches of high severity are a topic of great concern and rightly so. Big high severity patches require more active post-fire management for to retain forest, and they can lead to tight conversion. So the key question here is how much variability exists within pixels that appear identical based on satellite derived severity maps? Or in other words, how much variability might exist in a large high severity patch that based on a satellite map alone looks homogenous, um, but how homogenous is it really? Often a lot. I'm sure many of us have experienced this and visited field sites that didn't burn with the severity that we were expecting based on maps that we were using in the office. There are many intuitive explanations, um, including differences in pre-fire canopy cover and surface conditions, 
And these things can change over time following repeated disturbances. But while this phenomenon is widely observed and pretty intuitively explainable, um, we don't really have a reliable way to place bounds on the range of tree mortality that may exist within pixels that have the same DMBR value, for example. So I conducted the study in the Rimfire footprint within Yosemite National Park. And this time I combined the YFTP data set, which is the blue, blue box here, um, with 54 quarter hectare plots that we installed uh, throughout the surrounding landscape. I plotted satellite drive severity indices against observed percent mortality, and I used locally weighted regression to represent the range of observed mortality at any given level of satellite drive severity. Two things to notice here. First, there is not much of a difference between different indices. DMBR performed about as well as RDMBR, RBR, and DNDVI. And second, more interestingly, there's a huge range in observed mortality, mortality even within pixels that were considered high severity. So for example, these two pixels have the same RDMBR value, but actual mortality in one was 10%, while the other was 80%. So similar to um, logistic mortality models that, that we were talking about earlier, the overall prediction accuracy is generally pretty good. Um, previous studies have found R squared um, to be R squared and classification accuracy to be upwards of 0.7, um, which is accuracy high enough to make these maps really undeniably useful. But the uncertainty exists nonetheless, and thinking about it explicitly may have important implications for downstream applications of severity maps. So we can use this, this empirical range and observed mortality to map uncertainty on the landscape. This map essentially represents the range and estimated mortality that you would need to use to be confident that the actual predicted mortality level is within the range. So for much of this landscape, this range exceeded 50%, meaning that mortality could be 25% above or below the predicted mean mortality value. And 5% of the time, that range wouldn't even be wide enough to capture the true mortality value. This uncertainty was greatest at intermediate severity values, which we might expect. Uh, it's a lot easier for a satellite to see if a pixel is either completely scorched or not scorched at all. But if we look at the range within what would be considered high severity, there's still a considerable amount of variability within that. About 20 out of our 54 quarter hectare plots were classified as high severity based on a map of DNVR. And basal area, more, basal area mortality in these 20 plots ranged from 100% to as low as 25%. So the point here is not that the severity maps aren't accurate. They're reasonably accurate and they're incredibly useful. The point is that when we don't consider this uncertainty, especially when we classify severity into three broad classes, we're overlooking a key source of heterogeneity. We can see that some of the heterogeneity the fire creates in severity maps, but this research demonstrates that there's actually a lot more heterogeneity than we can see using satellite derived severity maps alone. So we can imagine how pattern metrics such as core area, patch size, and distance to edge might be really different if we were to consider variability within the high severity class. So to wrap this all up, I want to leave you with a couple final thoughts. Fire-induced tree mortality is a complex process and we'll likely never be able to model it perfectly. But examining the outliers can teach us what ecological factors interact with fire damage to determine expressed fire severity. Climate remains an obvious factor here, but neighborhood crowding might actually be more important at really fine scales. Neighborhood crowding is sort of uh, can mediate the, uh, the sort of climate is filtered through fine scale topography and, and uh, water availability, availability is determined by neighborhood crowding. Um, so at, at the tree to tree level, um, the effects of climate might be not as important as micro, micro site and, and tree neighborhoods. At broader scales, uncertainty in the relationship between satellite drive severity and field-based measures reveal a key source of heterogeneity that can't be detected by looking at severity maps alone. Variability in fire effects is a critical ecological function of fire, and this variability is underestimated if we just use the mean trend line. We can recapture some of this variability by augmenting severity maps with field visits um, or by pairing maps of severity with uncertainty 
or by uh, associating a probability with different uh, that a pixel is indeed within a certain severity class. Um, with that, I'd like to thank co-authors, Jim, Andrew, Van, Adrian, Phil, and Nate, um, and a bunch of other folks for, uh, for help in the field and with the research along the way, um, and funders in particular, Joint Fire Science Program. And I think I might have time for a few questions. Let's see. Yes, you did a, did a great job keeping, um, keeping to time. So um, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Sam, are there any questions in the chat? No questions in the Q&A section yet. Um, so people feel free to put them in the Q&A or you can unmute and ask um, through Huba. Right, so, so I'll, um, got a question. So neighborhood effects are, are important and do you see a way forward to for those kind of data to be made, you know, sort of made available on sort of a land fire um, uh, scale. Um, yeah. Any Thanks, Matt. That's a that's a great question, and a uh, yeah, that's a great point. That we have this this really unique data set with STEM maps. We're able to look at the importance of neighborhoods, but how did how does that become relevant to the models in FOFAM, where we don't have neighborhood metrics for Every individual tree. Um, yeah, I, I would, I've spent a bunch of time thinking about that. I think um, I'd be really interested to see if to see if this relationship is detectable using a broader scale metric of neighborhood, like forest density, for example. Um, yeah, I, my my suspicion is that we'll probably be able to see some effect. Probably not going to be as clear of an effect as using individual neighborhood around individual trees, unless stands were, were really homogenous and density really, you know, so a, a, a metric like density might really reflect um, the neighborhood conditions around every tree if the pattern was very regular. Um, but it, so I think it would be really interesting to, to try a similar analysis at, at a different scale using more wide data to see if, to see if that can still be detected. Right, yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, Maybe you could get there's there's more and more lidar data out there. You know, to what extent, you know, could could that give you the information you need? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any 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 questions? Yeah. Any yeah, we have a few. Um, what do you think uh, we should do to better convey uncertainty in burn severity maps, and how can we further reduce uncertainty? Um, that's also a great question. Um, I think that what I keep coming back to is, is continuous severity values rather than using classified, um, rather than using severity classes, using continuous value values helps us. Um, we can distinguish between DNBR of 400 versus 800, which both would be high severity, but one has perhaps a greater likelihood of 100% mortality, whereas uh, something that's on the lower end of high severity uh, maybe the mortality that we're expecting there is 95 or 98 percent, which is still high severity, but is is really fundamentally different than 100 percent mortality. Um, so, so using continuous values, um, possibly uh, maps of uncertainty. Um, but I, I think, uh, yeah, that's a, it's that's what I got for now. Thanks, Tucker. We got I think probably time for one more. Uh, do you think it would provide a more realistic map if you determined probabilities of alternative levels of severity and then assign them using a randomization process? Um, yes, I think that's that's a great idea. Um, it, it, I, I think if I'm understanding that right, it's it would be essentially taking a, taking reflectance values, but not using those reflectance values exactly. Almost doing a, a sort of re sort of a resampling of the landscape based on you have the reflectance value, but then you have a, an expected range of what true mortality actually would be. Um, so you could sort of, you, you can make a, a single map of severity that's rather than being what the satellite actually measured, it's, it's sort of, you're, you're reintroducing some of the heterogeneity um, 
but by by essentially resampling pixels with uh, with some kind of probability distribution. Um, so I, at least that's what I'm thinking that you're you were suggesting, and I, I think that's a great idea. Be useful because then you still you just have the one map of severity. You don't have to deal with with a map of uncertainty or a map of probability that that each pixel is classified correctly, um, which could be kind of cumbersome. You you still are just dealing with one map, but you're you're somehow incorporating that that extra variability in the map. Um, so I think that that could be a really nice solution to explore. Well, thanks for joining everybody. Yeah, great. Yeah, th thanks a lot. Um, uh, so Emma, um, I'll just tell everybody, you know, if you're following up on, you know, any questions you have for any of the speakers, please, you know, please follow up in uh, HOVA or the traditional, the normal way. Um, just wanted to, to, to uh, call out tomorrow. Um, so the last part of this uh, post-fire tree mortality um, special session is tomorrow morning. Um, there's a diverse mix of talks, for, uh, including long-term growth mortality, another remote sensing-based uh, talk, uh, process modeling of, of fire behavior and effects, and then decision support. So it's going to be a really interesting session and also encourage everyone to, to join the fire circle, um, including with your questions. Great. Awesome. Hey, uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers for sharing their expertise and experience with us today. Thank you, Matt, for being our uh, fantastic moderator. Uh, the session two will be available in Whova, the, this conference app within two weeks of the, of the Congress ending. Um, up next, we have our poster session starting at 3 p.m. Uh, that is centered around the Congress theme of Life with Fire, Prescriptions for Resilience. Many poster presenters will be available to chat with live, uh, to chat with live or answer questions on their posters, so please be sure to check it out. To access the presentations, please click on the Agenda tab and select Posters. Uh, we hope you join us for some great networking and discussion opportunities this evening, beginning at 5 o'clock Eastern time. We will have a few Fire Circle discussion sessions, our annual AFI members meeting, and open house and our We've Got a Movie Sign networking session. To choose the one you'd like to join, use the agenda tab to the left of your screen, click sessions, and then click the main session title to join. And also remember to participate in the passport contest by visiting and engaging with our virtual exhibitor booths. Simply click exhibitors in the navigation bar. Attendees with the most stamps will be entered into a drawing to win a free fire Congress registration for 2023. Thank you again to all of our speakers in that and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Emma.